All righty, if you have a Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 5. If you're visiting with us, we've been going through the fruit of the Spirit over these last several weeks. So let me start by asking you, when someone says that something is good, what do they mean? I know that's a big general question. So what, what, what does someone mean when they say that is good? Benefit. A benefit? Positive. It's positive? That's good. What'd you say? Enjoyable. Enjoyable? Yeah. A connection, did you say? A connection? A gift? It's correct or right. Okay, it's correct or right? Good. Good. Yeah, I, I just put, and these, this is not exhaust, uh, exhaustive, I put pure, noble, beautiful, excellent, of the highest quality, um, pleasant, pleasurable, whole, useful, without flaw, true, morally right. We, we've touched on some of those things. So it's interesting. We may say that someone is good. And it's, and it's interesting. Even the Bible occasionally says that this person was good. I think Bar uh, Barnabas was known as a good man. But we do that comparing them to other people. That's, you know, that's kind of the, the gauge when we say someone is good. That, and that's different, right, than when we say a steak is good, right? There's two different things. This word good is used in a really, really wide, um, really, really wide net, right? This idea of good. So I can eat a, a steak, medium rare, maybe rare, right? If you're, if you're smart, no, I'm like, and, and say, oh, that was good. But that's very different than saying a person is good. But when we say someone is good, we're comparing them to other people. And when we do this, we're really comparing, comparing varying levels of what is finite and flawed, varying levels of what's imperfect. Like you're good compared to this person or or maybe that group of people, but in its purest form, only God is entirely good and completely good in, in every aspect of his infinite being. So Jesus confirms this. There's a really interesting story that's related in a couple of the Gospels where a rich young guy comes to Jesus and says, uh, it, one man or another, he says, what, mu what good thing must I do to inherit or to get eternal life. That's, that's kind of how Matthew puts this story. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus replies, at least in part, he replies, why do you ask me about what's good? I always love this because he's, he's probably like, okay, what, that wasn't even the point, right? <laughs> but he says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one, and obviously he's referring to God himself, there's only one who is good. Good. In the purest sense, only God is good in everything that He is, everything in His infinite being. So now, what God created reflects His goodness. It says over and over in the creation account, when you read in Genesis chapter 1, God saw that it was good, right? He does this and He creates this and He creates that and He sees that it's good. In the end, He actually says, He sees that it was very good. So over and over, you see in this creation account that what God made, He says, reflects His goodness. But then mankind rebels against God and when they rebel against God, they also rebel against God's goodness. So we can say that really evil stands in contrast to all that God calls good. Evil is what twists and darkens everything that God has called good. So if this is true, I'm suggesting to you that it's true. The Bible suggests that it's true. If this is true... To really recapture an understanding of what is good. If, to really recapture what it is to move in goodness. I cannot do that in isolation. I need to return to the God who is holy and purely good. 
And I need to move in that goodness as he defines it. Right? So that's an important starting point for what we're thinking about in our theme today. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. We've been reading this passage each week for the last several weeks. The acts of the sinful nature, or literally the flesh, are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, on and on and on and on. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So the fruit of the Spirit is... We've gone through this this concept over the last several weeks, this supernatural harvest produced by the Spirit of God that indwells the believer in Jesus upon faith, and it stands in opposition to the inborn corrupt ways of the sinful nature. Love, agape, to unconditionally seek another's highest good. And I mentioned when we talked about love, it's most likely put first because all the, all the other things that are the fruit of the Spirit flow from it. Joy, a sustained inner gladness in knowing God through Christ. Peace, the removal of conflict and the development, right? Removal of conflict, remember, is part A, but then it's this development of relational harmony and wholeness, shalom, with God within ourselves and within our fellow man, and with our fellow man. Patience, a merciful relational long-suffering in spite of difficulty, in spite of difficult people, all of us included. Kindness, we went through last week, having a gracious and tender-hearted disposition. And then the the next for the Spirit is goodness. Ag-ath-o-sune, ag-ath-o-sune. Agathosune. <laughs> I'm not a Greek scholar. Agathosune. It's kind of fun to say if you go on Google. Agathos, agathosune. Um, this word in this form is only actually found four times in the New Testament. Romans 15, 14, 2 Thessalonians uh, 1, 11, Galatians 5, 22, and Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, where it says there, for you were once darkness, but Now you are light. That's interesting. He didn't even say you were in the darkness. He says you were darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, agathosune, righteousness and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. So this this specific combination of this Greek word is only used four times in in the New Testament, but the root word Agathos is actually used over 100 times. I think it was about 102 times in the New Testament. So I'm going to read a a quick uh, online Greek word study. Uh, We'll probably net you these definitions. I'm just going to read this paragraph. Goodness, agathosune, from agathos, benevolent, profitable, benefiting others, describes active goodness, virtue, excellence, or... Beneficence, um, which means the the desire, beneficence, means the desire to do good. It is high moral character reflected in being good, both in both nature and effectiveness. It finds its fullest and highest expression in that which is willingly and sacrificially done for others. It is moral and spiritual excellence manifested in active kindness. 
Agathos, Agathos Sune, Osune describes a positive moral quality characterized especially by interest in the welfare of others. It refers to active goodness as an energetic principle. I like that, an energetic principle. It is the generosity which springs from the heart that is kind and will always take care to obtain for others that which is useful and beneficial. So this goodness is a goodness that moves. It's a goodness that moves in generous and benevolent and positive action. And often, often at least even when that action is undeserved. As one writer put it, it is in the same family of virtues as kindness that we went through last week. But where kindness is, as we talked about last week, more of a, uh, a disposition, goodness points to an outflow of activity. So let's break this down just a little bit. So we could say this goodness is an inner ethic. Now, when I say it's an inner ethic, we have to re remember, and I'll keep reiterating, it flows from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit but it expresses itself outwardly in a way that actually benefits other people. An inner ethic that expresses itself outwardly to benefit others. So Peter describes Jesus in Acts 10, 38. And he's talking about Jesus' ministry. And he says that he was anointed by God. Um, and he's anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power and then he simply says that he went around doing good. And he adds, and healing those who are sick. And, but he sums this up by saying he goes around doing good. He was a do-gooder. <laughs> so we, here now, we, as a part of the church, this time in between the Advents where God has poured his Holy Spirit out as he prophesied in a way like never before into the believer who puts their faith in Jesus, we also are supposed to go around doing good in Jesus' name in a way that actually benefits other people. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, established for that church what he called uh, what was what's called often three simple rules that should guide the Christian life. Anybody know those three simple rules? Number 1, do no harm. Do no harm. Number 2, do good. And number 3, stay in love with God. So John Wesley would say, "Hey, those if you, can, if you can keep leaning into those things, you're going, to be, you're going to be on the right track. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. It's interesting, at times in some, of, in some of our Protestant traditions of Christianity, we so emphasize that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And when I say that, I will say, praise God, praise God, praise God, right? We so emphasize that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and not by our own good works, our own merit, our own efforts, that at times we fail to emphasize the fact that doing good in a way that benefits others, should be the natural outflow of your grace-given salvation. The Bible is very, very clear on this. We sometimes get a little nervous because it's like we don't want to give this impression that salvation is about doing good. I'm not saved by my good works. But we also need to emphasize that your grace-given salvation means that there should be this natural outflow of your life in what you are doing good as God defines it. Right, right over a page in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. I can't get before God and say, I did it. I'm good enough. I'm perfect. No, only God is truly good. But then it says, for we are God's workmanship, his, his masterpiece, his artwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, 
especially those who belong to the family of believers. And again, that's that same root word that we have here in Galatians 5.22. There are actually two, generally speaking, there are two Greek root words used for good in several different variations in the New Testament. Um, one points to what we might call what is beautiful, a beautiful aesthetic, something that is flawless. And the other, that the one we have here today, has to do with what is useful and beneficial. In the biblical context, we would say that uh, it would have what we would call um, often a moral or ethical aspect to it. In other words, what God calls good and the good that we're supposed to be about should be able to wisely distinguish between what is right and what is wrong, not according to me, but according to God. But it's not morality in theory. It's not just of the philosophers, right? It's morality in movement, in action. It steps beyond the passive restraint of do no harm. And it it becomes this energized activity to truly be helpful. So in other words, it's good to be able to look at an injustice. It's good to be able to look at someone who is in dire need. It's good to be able to look at something that is troubling or a difficulty that someone has and say, oh man, that's terrible right? That, that's, a, that's recognizing good, bad, right, wrong. That's terrible. But it's a different thing than to actually step up and intervene and do something about it. It's to say that I have this responsibility in Christ Jesus to be someone who actually looks for the good that I can do and then engage in it. And that takes kind of breaking out of the fog that we're often in in our own little world, our own little orbit, or our own little, you know, 12 inches between us and a screen, right? To be able to look for the good that I can do and engage in it. Now, as a side note, as you look to be one who engages good works for the benefit of others, this should be done in a way that's sensitive and humble and and not patronizing. Some people kind of have control issues that, that, that overflow into doing good because what they really want to do is control everybody else's lives. So they're always going to help and help and help and help and help because obviously you need it and obviously I can figure out what you need and do it for you, right? So, so it's not this help that's patronizing. It's this help that's really sensitive and humble. It takes Holy Spirit discernment. Like not all good is your good to do. That's important to remember too. Not all good good is your good to do, but as as we walk with Jesus and move in the spirit to say, okay, where would you have me engage? Where would you have me engage? Let me be sensitive to the needs. Where would you have me engage? But again, this, this inner morality, this drive toward benevolence is the result of God's Holy Spirit. It's to, it's to move in the goodness that is of the spirit's nature, not my own. It's to understand that apart from God's spirit, we may have a sense of morality. I think almost every human being has a sense of morality, what is good, right, just, and fair, but it's a broken compass. It doesn't point true north. So I have this compass that's like, eh, I know there's something out there that's good, right, just, and fair, and a lot of people are shooting in the dark. I think it's this, I think it's this, I think it's this, or it's a moving morality depending on the age, depending on the culture. My compass is broken, right? And a lot of people have a desire to act in benevolence, a desire to act in charity and kindness and goodness, but that typically runs subordinate and in submission to my drive for self-interest and self-preservation. But the goodness of God relies on God's moral compass. It doesn't pander and placate to the misplaced desires of the sinful nature. I was thinking it's like a parent who is incredibly gracious, incredibly loving, willing to give good gifts to their children. 
But at the same time, in that goodness and in that wisdom of being, hopefully, uh, being in a position of a parent, a parent also at times says, no, no, that's not good for you. No, Uh, you know, whatever, enough screen time, uh, enough jelly beans, uh, enough, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, no, no, you're you're not going to go there tonight or whatever. Like, there, there has to be this discernment in what is good. I'm willing to give good gifts. I'm not stingy, but there's also this goodness at times to say, no, not there, not now. Because that is what will harm. So loving goodness also draws those lines. It's a goodness that stands in opposition to what is evil, in opposition to what causes harm. That's why Romans 12, 9 can say, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, this active goodness is willing to take action for the aid of others, others that are hurting, others that are in need, uh, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, even when it comes at great cost to oneself. This is what we call generosity, right? Generosity. Uh, it's interesting. There are actually a few English Bible translations that translate this word, this word of goodness, as generosity. Generosity. James Montgomery Boyce, if anybody knew who he was, he's with the Lord now. He pastored at 10th Presbyterian uh, down in Philadelphia. He wrote in reference to this goodness mentioned here, the primary idea seems to be generosity that springs from kindness. Uh, C. Norman Bartlett wrote, the meaning of this word is generosity in things material and things spiritual. Stinginess I changed that word. He didn't use the word stinginess. But stinginess, that's what he meant, impoverishes while giving freely, enriches the soul. In the realm of the spirit, we lose what we keep and keep what we lose for Jesus' sake. In the realm of the spirit, we lose what we keep and keep what we lose for Jesus' sake. Now, it may be a, a bit too narrow to say that this word just means generosity, but it underscores an important aspect of it. God, if you, if you know God through Jesus Christ, you've come to faith in Jesus, God has been exceedingly generous toward you. Exceedingly generous. He has blessed you, it says in Ephesians 1.3, um, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has shown his generosity to us, so we should freely show our generosity toward others with what has been entrusted to us, time, talent, treasure. And the, the Bible actually says, and the writers of the Bible actually say, seem to say very clearly that to not be generous shows an unsettling disconnect to a profession of faith. Let me say that again. To not be generous, to not show goodness through generosity, like real-life generosity, shows an unsettling disconnect to those who would profess faith. Let me read just a couple of... uh, And again, I'm going to be reading several scriptures here over the last few minutes of this message, so... Bear with me. Uh, James says in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can, Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, in other words, isn't generous toward him, what good is it? So he's saying, if you have this faith that isn't acting out in goodness and generosity, like, wait a minute, there's a, there's a real disconnect there from what you call faith and what actually should be happening on the ground. John reiterates this in his, in his first letter, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's something we feel. That's something that costs us. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Now again, not every good is your good to do. But there certainly is good that God has prepared in advance for you to do. And some of that is going to be displayed in a goodness that is generous. And some of you are like, well, I don't have anything to give. Yes, you do. (laughs) Yes, you do. We are all entrusted at different levels. Now, certainly... Warren Buffett is entrusted differently than I am, right? But, but again, this goes beyond just material. It has to do with, with all that we have to offer. And, and in contrast to that, that, that kind of stinginess that seems to run contrary to faith, when you, when you embrace this idea of generosity, you're actually embracing what the Bible calls an eternal kingdom perspective, right? And, and, and a value system of God's kingdom. Jesus says in Luke... Chapter 12, starting at verse 32, he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's been generous, all right? He's been generous. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now you might be like, oh, that was just for the disciples. <laughs> well, are you a disciple? I mean, <laughs> was he just talking to Peter, James, and John, and, and Nathaniel? And like, who is he talking to? <laughs> well, sell my business. I mean, have you ever done? Like, so we want to give the overflow, right? So where we don't feel it. But generosity is actually something that we feel. And we do it because we have an eternal perspective, an eternal value system. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good. Now, what does that mean? To be rich in good deeds. Well, what does that mean? And to be generous and willing to share. In this way, right, they're going to have an eternal perspective, an eternal value system. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And listen, I'm not just talking about tithing. I think that's important. I'm just ta- I'm talking about generous lives, living. That's one of the values we have here at church, that we'd be a people of generosity. We would be a people that pours out the goodness of God with a willing spirit. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under uh, compulsion, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. But true generosity is cheerful and sacrificial. It gives the best, not the leftovers. I've said this before. Listen, taking an old, tattered bag of used clothes to the Salvation Army bin is not really generosity. It's this motivation that's not begrudging obligation, but to, to, to bring, it's a motivation to give what is good, to give what is best, to bring someone else's joy, or to alleviate suffering. Even especially when it comes at a cost to you. God's instruction to Old Testament Israel in Deuteronomy 15, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land your God, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted, these things go together, hard-hearted or tight-fisted. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. 
But even as we act generously towards others, as an outflow of love to other people, this should be done, Jesus says, as a quiet sacrifice to God. Right in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Like, don't, don't go and announce it with trumpets when you give to the needy. Just, just don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't say, hey, look what I'm doing. I'm giving. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, you know, like, let God be your audience. It's like, if, if it's just for a pat on the back, you've already received your reward, right? But if, if it's God is your audience, you're building up treasure, you're having a kingdom mindset, an eternal value system, He will reward you in heaven. And God sees every act of goodness. Jesus says this in Matthew 16. He's like, listen, even when you're quietly just visiting that that sick person, even when you're quietly just making a meal and bringing it to them, even when you're just giving a drink of water to someone who's thirsty, like God sees every act of goodness and generosity. He sees it. That's what's important. Now lastly, and I'll wrap up here quickly, There is an aspect of God's goodness that reflects his righteousness, his his perfect rightness and all that is, his holiness. But here, what it reflects is his grace. It's engaging in loving action even when the recipient is not deserving of this kindness. And this has been and always is God's way toward us. We are the ones that don't deserve it. But he says, I'm generous, I'm loving, I'm good, I'm kind. And we receive all those things in Jesus Christ. And we're commanded to do likewise. One more time in the Sermon on the Mount, last couple of verses, Jesus says, and remember again, this wasn't just for them 2,000 years ago, it's for us. You have heard it that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. In other words, take your revenge, right? He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away the one who wants to borrow from you. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. True grace goes so far beyond do no harm. It acts in goodness and love to those who deserve it least, which is all of us. So I'm going to wrap up just with a little, very simple story. Just happened last week. And it's one of those little stories that like kind of keeps piercing my heart. So last Sunday, I spoke on kindness. And right after church, we go down Downstate, we went down to Philadelphia, visit a couple of our daughters and our, and our cutest in the world grandson. And we stop in the Pocono Wawa. Any of you have been to the Pocono Wawa? I would think several of you. And man, it is swamped. And it often seems swamped there. And like every, every like gas pump is backed up. I mean, there's lines at every gas pump. There's people waiting. So I finally get my spot at a gas pump. And there's a guy in front of me who's done pumping his gas and he's cleaning every like every glass piece of glass on his car with a with a paper towel. He's like, and I'm like, I said to Cheryl, so I said to Cheryl, I was like, look at this guy. Look at who does he think he is? I mean, you think this is like his, his personal car wash. Like people are waiting, people are behind me. Every every place has got a line. I'm like, I the nerve. Then the guy leaves his car, right? So we're not talking about Liberty Exxon where nobody's at the, you know, where he leaves his car. So to go in and do his business and use his bathroom, the bathroom and get coffee. And I'm like, can you believe this guy? So I go into Wawa, I park, come on now, I park in a regular parking spot, let someone else use the pump. I go into Wawa, I I use the the bathroom, I get my coffee, and now I end up right behind this man. (laughs) 
And I look out the window, <laughs> and Cheryl's in the car laughing at me. <laughs> She's just kind of giggling, and, and she said later, I kind of gave him the... <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking that I'm, I'm noble, because I'm doing no harm, you know? <laughs> like, it could have been like, hey, bozo, who do you think you are? And I got in the car, and... and Cheryl and I talked about this and laughed about it a little bit. I said, man, I just preached on kindness. I am, I have so far to go, really, so far. And um, Cheryl was just like, you should have bought him coffee. You should have bought his coffee. And part of me, like, so I was like, that seems like what, it's like a buck 40 at Wawa. And that would have been like a really hard buck 40. I'm being honest, in that moment, the guy, I thought the guy was a jerk. And she's like, what, what would it have been if you'd just been like, hey, buddy, let me get your coffee? And I was like, wow. That would have been grace. That would have been just a little drop of the same grace that God has bestowed in this jerk's life. I'm no different than that guy. He could have been having a horrible day. I don't know what the deal is. I need God's grace just as much as he does. So what would it have been in that moment not to just not do harm, but to do good. My guess is we're all going to have some opportunities like that this week. Father God, we recognize that only you are purely good. We pray because in our flesh, our, our compass is broken. In our flesh, even when we desire to be charitable, we seek self-interest and self-protection first. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to produce a harvest of goodness through us. We need to cooperate with that spirit when we're standing on line at Wawa, when we're rubbing shoulders with people that are acting out and need the grace that you've shown us. Those little moments that we can be generous when we feel it by showing love and compassion and giving. Lord, work in us. May your spirit arise in us. Energize us, Lord God, with this spirit of goodness that it may truly benefit others. In Jesus' name. And it's in his mighty name we pray, amen.